Good morning. We are ready to start our next session, which is on the topic of regional. Raise my voice. Usually people are complaining and talking loudly, so. So our session is on national, regional, and global science collaboration. My name is Joe Chapman. everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk at this really amazing conference for amazing people. I am Mustafar from Birzeit University in Palestine. Uh, and my talk will be about Arabic natural language processing. So I will be talking about semantics. You know, uh, you can you know, when we make jokes, we, we, we typically play with semantics. So for computers to understand semantics is something so complicated. But I will explain what is it and how computers really understand uh, uh, semantics. Uh, so, you know, we do natural language processing, which is part of artificial intelligence and it is the fourth revolution, and because it's a fourth revolution, uh, many countries, or at least the developing countries, have to take this as an opportunity to develop uh, their capacities and to find their uh, opportunities. And for Arabic, so Arabic natural language processing is part of artificial intelligence, and uh, for Arabic, to, to do research on Arabic, it's not just something cultural, it's actually economy. We make money, we make jobs out of, it's an industry when we talk about Arabic. Uh, do you know how many applications or how many times you use natural language processing technologies and with your mobile every day? A huge amount, actually. But you don't know that they are natural language processing. So it's a huge market. Um, when we talk about natural language processing, we are talking about, I will act. Uh, when we talk about natural language processing, we talk about uh, like language, uh, uh, tickers, OCR, uh, speech recognition, machine translation, uh, fake news detection, uh, hate speech detection, and etc. Et uh, this is the laser pointer is actually, it seems not working, but uh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, applications, it's clear for you, but when we do research, we do something else. We, we don't really care too much about the applications. The underneath, the enabling technologies, actually, uh, are the focus of the research community. Uh, how you say, for example, tra uh, uh, transform speech into text, or you, we do morphological tagging. This is an example. Uh, So, as you see here, uh, we tap, we tap everywhere. Uh, I will, this is going to work. Oh, okay. That's uh, so, as you see here, I will do. So, we say this is uh, it's a uh, granular, effective verb. 
this is not a difficult dilemma. Um, we, we segment the word into prefixes, a, ya, uh, the stem, or the root, uh, suffix. So every word in the text we need to understand this. Uh, we also do syntax parsing, identity recognition, where systems can be used, and so on. These technologies, uh, if we have success on these technologies, we build good applications. You know? So I will show you something here today. Uh, but just to mention that this is a huge market for uh, uh, the Arabic community and actually for all communities, for all countries even. We have a market of 400 million users.
So we created this with collaboration with the UN and with the AUD, and we are going to announce it uh, at Civic Office tonight. So, and this is also a very kind of right. And you say you put the wear, and everywhere in the uh, direct is uh, annotated or with the part of the speech, with suffixes and prefixes, and so on. One minute. Okay, so I will quickly in this one minute show you something that we did with, so you see here, Sammy works for Jimmy Carter Center. Sammy is a person, Jimmy Carter Center is an organization. Okay, so we did this for Arabic. Uh, I will skip the details. So here, say, BZ in the Persian. Jamaat BZ for the Ta'awun Ma'awas, the Dwarf Sahir, to not them, blah, blah, blah. This is a text. So we are able to pass this text and recognize uh, entities. And the last thing I want to show you is if you have a wear and uh, you have like uh, you have a beautiful eyes, eyes have six meanings in, uh, in English. In Arabic it's actually uh, deal. Can I help this somebody? Yeah. So in Arabic it's 13 meanings. Uh, like the Sidan Rayon Shia. We want to know which meaning is the intended in this sentence. So if you change the context, it has another meaning. So we did it with accuracy uh, 95. Go next. First of all, thank you. Thank you for this uh, beautiful conference, and uh, it's, it's great to see all of you. Uh, today, my focus is going to be on a, uh, a people first digital strategies where we bring things together. But before I get there, uh, I came to you from Qatar Foundation, Hamad Ben Khalifa University, a university that established in 2010 with a very unique vision of uh, uh, innovation and research. Uh, this is an early graduate university. Uh, with five uh, branch campuses, uh, that's uh, American universities such as uh, Texas A&M, Wild Cornell, and so on. So we have six colleges, three research institutions, and the unique part of our digital strategies here is the research institutions. This is where we, we, we bring things together. That's where we merge things together. Merge in the sense that you have research, you have teaching, learning, and you have innovation, and how you bring them all together. So uh, that's look, uh, that's so uh, in our publication, our, our intellectual contribution, uh, this is very much showing you that the contribution happened since 2010. 5,900 publications, 6,000 citations, and so on. Uh, but the important part that we want to talk about here is our focus area. Precision business, sustainability, artificial intelligence, social progression, and, 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 and progressive education. So how do you take all those diverse needs and bring them in, in, in a human-first digital strategy? 
So when you talk about digital strategies, the first question we ask, how will a people digital uh, strategy continue to evolve to support your diverse need? Before you go there, you need to address your, uh, your, your, your mandate. You have critical area. That, that those critical areas actually apply to any higher aid, any innovative uh, research area. So your board of governing like you to, uh, to, to improve access and retention. Uh, that's come uh, your accreditation agency, improvement of, of, of learning and improvement of your publication and, uh, and how you assess all that. So assessment becomes very much the unique mix of everything we do. As a matter of fact, uh, I do a lot of accreditation visit and the first thing we ask you, how do you assess the impact that's become the fact. Uh, our faculty, our researcher, like you to help them stay, stay current, be competitive, and at the same time, don't make technology the drivers of good teaching, learning, and research. Technology is limited. Our students like you to stay affordable and, and be competitive. So that's lead you to what a people first strategy should do to you. So it should provide accessible, affordable, quality learning opportunity. That's the first thing. It should bring technology to the core learning process. It should facilitate teaching, learning, and research and innovation inside and outside. Provide practical real world exposure. So we usually tell the student, uh, when, uh, when I uh, advise my student, I tell them, you graduate with a four year degree, a four year experience in four years. When you add your master, you add 18 months to that, so that's bring you to six years of experience. To be competitive, that's how you have to do it. If you graduate with just uh, no experience while you are doing your schooling, that's, that's will, you will not be able to compete. Facilitate the learning, provide practical real world exposure. And that's the third. Uh, how many of you here, uh, uh, when, you, when, you, when you came to your class, if you teach, or advise, or so on? So when you see them come to you, how many of you know your student what job they're looking for? How many of you know your curriculum preparing the student for a specific job? As a matter of fact, we teach and develop and invade for jobs that doesn't even exist yet. That's, that's, that's the discussion we had in 2010. So now we, we are teaching not to hunger the greed in a world we are teaching to, to provide real practical exposure to the technology and to the real world that we encounter as a go. We allow for effective and efficient delivery of support services and that's become very important. Provide an opportunity for active and interactive. Uh, provide ability to accommodate diverse learning style. So the teaching will change, the research change, the fact that you stand in front of the class and teach that change. As a matter of fact, uh, the best teaching is not the one done by you. Or the best research is not the one done by you. The one that's done by you. Uh, in a collaborative environment. Efficient access to the service. So, that leads us to the juice of the whole thing. Okay? So, number one, we need to strategically and tactically, strategically and tactically, align with the vision of our institution. Okay? We need to, plan to, to establish a unified strategic layer. That's strategic layer in our focus area. That's strategic layer in the market demand. That's strategic layer in the region. We need to provide an agile uh, in class and a responsive digital strategies for that. Allow for effective and efficient. Okay? And the most important piece here is foster sustainable partnership. What happening here today is something, uh, something great. Uh, you have 22 countries and I think out of those 22 countries, most of them are, are, are represented here and more. Uh, so we must be an advocate for a line. We must be an advocate for understand what's coming in the future and try to choose the worthwhile, the, a party that's worthwhile. So don't be about the, the, the model of today. Okay, today you do your hair in the left, tomorrow you do it in the right. That's not how we, how we invade. We invade based on data, we invade based on strategy. We must keep that in the latest frame. That's pretty much it. But the most important piece that I would like to leave you again, I have three minutes. Uh, the, the, the message that I'd like to leave with you today, collaboration is number one. And this conference, if there is anything we have learned out of this conference, is 
collaboration leads us to better product and better results. That's, that's, that's the most important piece in accomplishing your digital strategy. Uh, you cannot do it alone. You have to have people with you and you have to have uh, infrastructures. The infrastructure of today is not the infrastructure that you build in your data center. It's not the infrastructure that uh, you buy. It's the infrastructure that you can collaborate and share and use. So the community models of infrastructure is the model of today. With that, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Okay, our next speaker is joining us remotely. He is Edo Kimos Konstantinidis with the European Network of Living Labs in Greece. And he's going to be speaking on the topic of living lab approach to co-creating open science and open innovation. Now, it's Hello, good evening, can, can, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, apologies for not joining uh, you uh, physically. It was not possible, but I'm really happy that I can attend and also that I can participate and share with you what we do. I'm Evdogimos Konstantinidis and I'm the president of the European Network of uh, Living Labs. And I'm here to speak about the Living Lab approach in co-creating open science and open innovation uh, Gerontech uh, ecosystems. First of all, what a living lab is. Living labs are open innovation ecosystems in real life environments based on a systematic user co-creation approach that integrates research and innovation activities in communities, placing citizens at the center of innovation. But when we see, when we see uh, what innovation is, if we look uh, around, we see that every time it's about value for the customer, value for the client. It's about staying relevant to the needs of the client. And uh, Living Labs are, operate actually as intermediaries among the different stakeholders in order to jo co-create joint value uh, for all the stake involved stakeholders and to allow rapid prototyping or to scale up innovation in business. At the head of any type of living lab, there are two key processes uh, taking place, open innovation and user-driven innovation. But open because it is about tapping on the knowledge and know-how that exists outside of our organization by engaging with others. User-centered or driven because living labs act, um, actively and directly involved throughout the innovation development process and yours, and users, citizens, clients, uh, academia, researchers, students, any kind of uh, stakeholder. And here, innovation is not just about technology, but about implementing new or significantly improved goods or services, processes, or even new organizational methods in business practice or work, uh, workplace organizations in order to create value. And all is the European Network of Living Lab is an international not-profit association which aims to promote and enhance user-driven innovation ecosystems, more, the, the Living Labs. And, and all has actually uh, 164 active members, 80 of them in Europe, 80% of them in Europe, and 20% uh, globally. Our mission is to create opportunities for all our members, to develop the capacities of the Living Labs, to support partnerships among the, uh, our members, but also external stakeholders, to scale up impactful and value-driven innovation projects uh, and, and uh, products, and also to provide high-quality advocacy. As any of us uh, can imagine, we can find living labs in a plethora of different domains. We can find living labs for smart cities, for environment, for culture and creativity, even for artificial intelligence. And this is why the European Network of Living Labs is organized in action oriented task forces and working groups. Here you can see some of them with a strong uh, um, uh, participation of members in the health and well-being. And going now more to the health and well-being, I would like to say that all of us are aware that innovation for aging, for health, and especially for, for aging can happen in a plethora uh, uh, of, uh, of domains. 
like fall detection, uh, bathing, transfer, physical rehabilitation. I'm sure that I know that all of you are aware of this. But what are the needs when we try to create innovation for this? If I take the example of a startup, but by startup I don't mean the company startup, but any initiative with a high uncertainty, it's, uh, the need is to create an MVP in order to evaluate, validate uh, the initial assumptions. But innovation companies in health domain need early adopters to validate their assumptions. They have DevOps. You can easily find uh, the tools in order to create technology, but you need also research ops as well, in order to focus on the business. And by research jobs, we mean that any service that can be provided that the company is not interested in, like taking, uh, applying for an ethical application, making an ethical application. Most of the time, the companies do not invest in building such a strong network of stakeholders. Only large companies do it. And the biggest fear, actually, is building something that nobody wants. On the other hand, we have the living labs that can provide such services. They can provide services for study protocol, for ethics, for recruitment, for providing infrastructures that are needed, like hospitals, and also support piloting and evaluation activities, something that the companies would like to have and, uh, and also innovation would like to have and they wouldn't be interested in developing but buying. And this is what we do actually us and all and also our members, we try to harmonize these services that the Living Labs can provide. So at the end of the day, when I say as uh, a company that I got uh, um, uh, an, uh, um, a design thinking, when I went through a design thinking process in a Living Lab in Australia, to mean exactly the same when I say that I went as a company B, I went to uh, a design thinking process in, uh, in Europe to mean exactly the same in order to increase the value by harmonizing and standardizing the living lab service and procedures. And to do so, we have a strong body uh, of people for, on the harmonization uh, board, as you can see. Here are some of the services that can be provided by health and well-being living lab. You can see, uh, for instance, clinical trials, prototyping uh, testing, usability testing, simulation tests, and many others. And all these services and many more can support the development phase, starting from the design thinking, going through the iteration of providing the MVPs, and even touching the agile by uh, having this print review where you meet the clients and then you get feedback and then you do the iteration again and then you, you try to increase the value that you provide. So what is the added value of Living Labs? I would say, if I had to reply with one sentence, I would say real life observation and experimentation, because this is what Living Labs can provide. Since, uh, 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 because everything is about learning from each other and building trust. We exchange knowledge and experience in a fast, efficient, transparent, and trustful way. We, we try to increase the communication and the common understanding among the Living Labs and among the stakeholders of the Living Labs. But the challenge is when we want to involve older adults in the innovation is that if the older adults do not see the real interest in the technology providers, they're not that transparent when providing feedback. They have to feel that you care about them in order for them to be open and provide real feedback. But how much can a company invest in building such an environment of trust just for one product? And this is what Living Lab this is what Living Labs can do. They can build trust with stakeholders and older, and older adults, which takes a lot of time and uh, real interest. Here you can see some activities of some of our Living Labs. These are activities where we involve older adults in all our activities as a Living Lab in order to be ready to recruit people for the needs of a company or from an organization that wants to uh, create innovation. And this takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. We involve them in, uh, as you can see here, in uh, playgrounds in order to uh, build a better uh, city for them, in uh, co-creation activities with post-its, and also in uh, university yes. courses. One of our living labs, the Saloniki Action and Health, uh, uh, Action for Health and Wellbeing Living Lab, uh, has created the community partners of experience 
where we have more than 70 older adults over 60 years old and we used to call them early stage researchers over 60 years old. And actually they are really happy to participate because they can see the value. It's not that we invite them to come to the university or to our living lab only when there is a need from a company, but we try to involve them in all uh, our activities as if they were members of our uh, living lab. Uh, touching one more thing, I would like also to present, to say that, or to touch upon the fact that living labs can be considered also, are considered also as either research or technology infrastructure. And this is what the Vitalize project does. Uh, the challenges of the, the project is that uh, researchers or those who create innovation, they need access to key research infrastructures and they don't want to waste the resources on identifying and accessing a research infrastructure. And we know, I have already uh, mentioned the complications when uh, we need to, to create, to, when we want to do innovation in health and well-being domain. So we try to avoid project-oriented living labs. And by project-oriented living labs, I mean that when you want to create innovation, you have to create your own, to set up and build your own living lab, and then to do the innovation process, use, exploit the living lab, and then leave it die. So in our case, what Vitalize do is actually, we, which is coordinated by NOL, we invite uh, researchers or companies to innovate through existing living lab instead of uh, building their own living lab. And in our case, we have three projects running on uh, using this uh, existing research infrastructures on rehabilitation, transitional care, and everyday living environment. Here you can see some of the living labs of, uh, that provide their infrastructures. You can see the link uh, vitalize-project.eu. These are some of the images of the infrastructures. We have infrastructures like hospitals, centrifuges, we have uh, simulation uh, hospitals, and many different other places. And we have open calls, so companies or external researchers can apply in order to have their um, expenses covered to visit one of these living labs and conduct part of their study there. But as and all, we want to go one step further and go beyond projects. And this is what we do by uh, creating a platform where external uh, researchers will be able, uh, anyone actually, any stakeholder will be able to find the living lab in order to conduct part of the study. Just to mention, we have also our capacity building program where, where we can uh, create capacity on how to build your own living lab, but also how you can exploit existing living labs as a researcher, as a researcher. And that's all from my side. It took me two more minutes, apologies for this, but I hope it was interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. That is very interesting, and uh, I'm sure all of us here would like to admit it or not, think about this for the future. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next speaker, unfortunately, is unable to uh, join us today, uh, even on remote. So I will now ask um, Hassan Farhan to, uh, from the University of Jordan School of Engineering. And he's going to speak on performance analysis of a hybrid channel for foglet-assisted smart asset reporting. Uh, hi everybody, uh, basically uh, my name is Hassan Farahni, I'm a professor at the University of Jordan. Basically I, would, uh, I will talk today about uh, some topic, maybe it's uh, out of the pivot of the conference. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, very thankful for the uh, organizer for this uh, beautiful conference. So today I will talk in a new technology called visible light communication. Basically, and in summary, we can use this light for lightning and uh, providing data instead of Wi-Fi. This technology is called visible light technology, and the abbreviation will be Li-Fi instead of Wi-Fi. Li-Fi, Li stands for light, Phi stands for fidelity. Uh, so, so, I can change from here. I will go through uh, these topics. What is the visible light communication? Why optical or visible light communication? 
Uh, what is the application of optical communication and what is the advantages? Then I will give you an example uh, for uh, our work in this field. So, visible light communication refers to the communication technology which utilizes a visible light source as signal transmitter, the air as transmission media, and the appropriate photodiode as signal receiving one. As I told you before, so now everybody knows the lid. lid. Many, many times you hear, oh, I, I want to change my lamps to lid. Lid stands for light emitting diode. This diode uh, has a double benefits. We can use it for lightning and also we can use it for sending the data. And, and, and this is as a uh, transmitter. What's about the receiver? The receiver also it's, a, it's called photodiode. photodiode. So the lead diode change the electric current to light and the photodiode change the light to electric current. And of course we use the space or the free space as the medium. Visible light communication is another kind of optical wireless communication which uses visible light spectrum. When I'm, when I'm talking about the spectrum, it's, it's very huge. When you are saying from 400 to 800, almost terahertz. So the, the data rate and the bandwidth for the visible light is very, very huge. So maybe somebody now asking also, what is the, what is the system we use those days? Those days we are using something called radio frequency radio frequency or electromagnetic waves. So, uh, now why do we need the optical communication? I want to tell you an example now. Assume this hotel, which we are in now, has for example 1,000 rooms. But all the rooms are occupied. But with more visitors still coming to the hotel. So we have to look for another hotel or we have to look for another space. Now, the, the, this uh, picture shows the crowded of the electromagnetics, which is the system which we use those days. So as you, as you can see, every single frequency are occupied, but the human needs for communication and for technology is still increasing, still increasing. So we have to look for an uh, uh, alternative. The alternative uh, suggestion was the Visible light. The visible light. So there, there are many, many applications basically for the visible light communication. Basically, we have two types of application. We have indoor application and we have outdoor application. Most of research in those days focusing on the indoor. Why? Because, for example, uh, I, I, I use this this lamp for lighting and for bringing data for me. But what's about the light? So, the light coming from the ultra light consider as a noise for me. So, but in, in, the, indoor, in the indoor application, we can, we can control this noise. For example, I could please turn off this light, turn off this light, and you can put the curtains on the, on the windows. Everything will be okay. But what's about the outdoor application? Outdoor application is very, very challenging. Uh, why? Because there is, there is uh, many, many sources for light. For example, my car, my, uh, the, the front, the front uh, lights for my car is lit, and your front car is also lit. So I can communicate with you because you have it in your car, and I, I have it in my car, so I can communicate. But what's about the light coming from the nearby cars, or the advertising as a, as a, uh, panels, or the street lamps? Of the city? So there is the challenge, and the big challenge for the outdoor application is the sun because for the sun of the spectrum of the visible of the sun is coming in the same spectrum of the visible light. So it's a big challenge. Basically, my my uh, topic and my field are uh, focusing on the outdoor uh, uh, application, especially vehicle to vehicle communication. How the vehicles can communicate with each other, and we can talk. Please uh, be careful. There's a light on the road. I can send you. I can. If you are behind me, I, okay, I will, so maybe there is a radar, please reduce your velocity or something, or your speed, something like that. So, uh, how, how, do we, how did we come over these challenges? We have some filters, we modify some filters, and also uh, 
uh, we uh, basically and this is some some receiving uh, something called differential receiver, so we can we can overcome this noise, but still this research at the beginning. So in the indoor application, which most of the uh, uh, scientists now uh, working on, it's like traffic communication, public data broadcasting, indoor broadband broadcasting in the hospitals also. My friend, sometimes when you are going to the hospital, you find this sign, this term of your mobile. Why? Because these the, uh, MIR uh, uh, equipments uh, using the uh, electromagnetic waves, and also your mobile has electromagnetic waves. Also, when you are going to the flight, the, 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 the takeoff and, and the landing, the, most of the people should uh, turn the, uh, their mobile off. Why? Because there is an interference between, between the electromagnetic waves. So we can overcome this, this point if we use the visible light spectrum or visible light communication. And also there is a home access network, as I told you. Soon, I hope so, soon we will, we will hear about something called Li-Fi. Again, Li-Fi. You will use the, the lamps to your home for lightning and also you will use it for internet. And also there is some application for military uh, uses. Uh, basically, this is a simple group diagram for disability light communication. Uh, I don't know how I can use the pointer. Yeah, this is the data source, it's an electric signal, and there is a driver. So the LED here is like in the change the electric signal to light and transmit it through the channel. This is the free space. And this is the photodiode, which, which, which works as a receiver. Then it goes to the, the traditional receiver and you will get the data again. Diagram for visible light communication. Yeah, what is the advantage? What is the advantage? Somebody said, okay, we are okay, we have the electromagnetic, and uh, now everything is going well, I can talk, I can use my mobile, I can, I can, I can. But two minutes. Two minutes. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Time goes. Okay, okay. I, I, I will continue. So, uh, my, my friend, as I told you, the spectrum of the radio frequency now is very powerful. There is no more space to add any, any uh, service for the communication. But the bandwidth for the visible light is very huge and it, it's unregulated and it's free. Also, my friend, the, the receiver and the transmitter for the electromagnetic waves is very complicated. Very complicated means more money, costly. As an engineer, when I want to do some design, I have to take it in my consideration the budget, the money. So, visible light, uh, the transmitter and receiver are more simple, which means less money. Uh, also, the, the, the uh, more important point is the security. My friend, more of us now, I call anybody, maybe I'm coming from Jordan, basically, um, and my kids in Canada, they can call me now. So, everybody, can collect because some, some uh, uh, like uh, any devices he can collect my call, right? But in the visible light, what you see, what, what you see, what you can uh, see. So for security, it's very good. If I light, uh, if I turn the light on in this room, nobody can see the, room, the, the light in the second room. So for the security, is very, very important. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, and also, it's very good for health. Uh, and also it's very similar. Basically here I, 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 I give some example, maybe you are not interested in this example, uh, but I, I will go through very, very fast. Basically there is something called foglet. Foglet, what is a foglet? Fog a foglet is like, you can, uh, you can read it like a black box. We put it in the desert area or in the highway. So now the modern car, the modern cars have some very, very high sensors. For example, if, if some accident happened with this car or some uh, critical health issue happened with the driver, so there is a sensor can send a uh, signal to this foglet and this foglet connected to the helpers, like police, fire department, mid-care, and blah, 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 blah. So if some, some, maybe some accident happened and the uh, driver go, go to, to be uh, unconscious, so the sensor will send automatically this data to the foglet and we took it well as a conduit to the helper. So basically now, those days, we use these, these things in, uh, in, in foreign countries nowadays. So we use the electromagnetic 
signal. But we are trying, or we have some research to change the connection to be through the visitor line. This is what we did. Thank you very much. I'm sorry because I exceed my time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Clearly, a, a very interesting subject and one that deserves more time. Maybe in yeah, the but this, yeah, this is what I'm saying. So uh, I'm, I'm happy. I had my PhD. Can we just one minute? One minute, please. So I, I, I uh, my interesting thing is the visible life. I did my PhD in Canada and the same. So I'm happy. I am happy to do free workshop for any any university interested in this topic because this is really really it's very important and it will save a lot of money and a lot of things for the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. So okay, so I. I've been advised that our that my uh, speaker, Hussein Al Bagli, is also unable to uh, reach the conference. So we now move to our last speaker, who is connecting remotely, Rafiq Al Rabit, who will be speaking about the Hyper Kamikande collaboration. Rafiq. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I please get a confirmation that my voice is clear? Okay. Uh, technical team is working on it. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, can you at least see my slides? We can see your slides. No. And you can hear my voice. Oh, I'm sorry, no, we can't. Where they're still getting your slides up. Okay. If anyone from the technical team can let me know when can I start, I would appreciate it. Okay, now we can see your slides. Okay, and I will try to signal you at about two minutes left. Okay. okay. So, perfect. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, allow me first to, to thank the organizers for the um, kind invitation. Unfortunately, Professor Mohamed Gouberi, who's uh, representing Morocco in Hyper-K collaboration, wasn't able to be among us today. And uh, I am pleased to, to present his slides for you in the coming few minutes. So um, our talk is um, about the hyper can the international collaboration and how Morocco is taking part in this experiment. Um, the points that I will try to cover are the following. Um, first, since HyperK is mainly in a neutrino experiment, we will start by a brief overview on um, neutrinos. Uh, what are they? Why is it important to study them? Um, where we will mention in particular the neutrino oscillation phenomena. Next, we will introduce the HyperK uh, experiment, namely the design of the far detector. Um, the current stages, since it is still under construction, uh, and its physics program like uh, neutrino oscillation and proton decay. Uh, the last section is the hub of our talk, where we will discuss the Moroccan participation to the uh, ongoing efforts, uh, in particular the, uh, at the level of uh, calibration, physics analysis with different programs, and computation and software development. Okay. So what are neutrinos? Um, the neutrino was int introduced for the first time by uh, the physicist Wolfgang Pauli back in 1930 to explain the, the missing energy, uh, momentum, and angular momentum in a natural phenomenon called beta decay, where a nucleus decays, uh, if you want, into a different nucleus, all by emitting uh, an electron. And to, to save the... Uh, conservation energy, momentum, and angular momentum loads, it was necessary to introduce a or an invisible particle called neutrino, uh, which will carry the, the missing quantities. And um, a neutrino is basically an elementary particle, just like electrons or, or, or quarks. 
um, in terms of being fundamental. And an elementary particle is basically a particle that is not composed of any more fundamental particle. So elementary particles are basically the building blocks of, of our universe. Um, however, unlike electrons or quarks, neutrinos interact only via what we call the weak nuclear interactions, making them one of the hardest particles to detect. We call them ghost particles because they rarely interact with matter, including um, our detectors. And this is in fact the, the reason why we need to build huge um, detectors just to observe few neutrino events. And neutrinos like the uh, other leptons uh, come in three different families or generations if you want. One for each lipton. So we have electron neutrino, mu neutrino, and tau neutrino. And, and each one of them can oscillate while propagating through space time. It can oscillate between these three uh, uh, generations of flavors. Okay. Uh, the formulation of the standard model, neutrinos uh, have been assumed to be massless, so without mass. Um, but this has been proved to be wrong. Uh, after the discovery of what we call neutrino oscillations. Yet the, the mechanism and origin of these masses is still a mystery that nobody could answer up to now. Um, now, now we know what are neutrinos, but why we are interested in studying them? So besides being curious about their own properties, uh, neutrinos may be our way to answer some of the most fundamental unanswered questions about the universe uh, and its evolution. Um, questions like the origin of matter. Um, if you are not a physicist, you might be surprised to know that the question of how did it come that uh, everything around us exists is still an open question. In fact, according to the famous Big Bang theory, there was as much matter particles as antimatter particles. And you can see antimatter particles as particle killer, okay? So if a matter meets its antimatter, they will kill each other and annihilate into pure, pure energy, uh, particle lights, photons. Um, so which means that all matter should have been annihilated at some stage of the evolution of the universe, which means that according to the Big Bang theory, we are not supposed to exist. Yet uh, here we are. Um, and astrophysicists can tell that from what we, they call cosmic radiation background, they can tell that for each one billion matter antimatter pairs, there was one extra uh, matter particle. And that tiny excess is what everything around us is made of. Uh, however, the origin of that excess is still unknown. And physicists believe that neutrinos can provide answers to this question through what we call the uh, long baseline experiments. Uh, in these pictures, you see uh, the next generation uh, long baseline or LBL experiments. Uh, on, the, on the right side, you can see the Hyper-K where we manufactured neutrinos and anti-neutrino beams in, in G-Park proton accelerator will be directed uh, towards the hyper k detector 300, almost 300 kilometers away. Um, and in a try to, to see if actually neutrinos and anti-neutrinos behave in a different way. Uh, and this behavior is simply the oscillation. Uh, and if it happens that they actually behave in a different way, we say that the CP or charge parity symmetry, um, I, I'm sorry, is, uh, how much time is left? I can't hear you if any one of the technicians can repeat Three that. Three and a half minutes. Sorry, I can't hear that. So I, I, will, I, will, I will continue. Um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side, on the left side, you can see the uh, competitor of Hyperkey, which is Dune, a deep underground neutrino experiment, being built here in the US with a longer baseline of 8,300 um, kilometers. Okay, so Hypercamu Candy is actually the third uh, of Kamuka experiments. The first was Kamuka Candy, 
which is Kamioka Nucleon Decay Experiment that was mainly built to, to, to look for proton decay predicted by some unification approaches beyond the standard model and ended up unintentionally observing supernovae neutrinos, um, a discovery that was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics for the year of 2002. The second uh, experiment is Super Kamiokande. So it looks like Kamiokande, except that it's much, much bigger, almost 20 times bigger. And uh, Super K contributed to the um, uh, discovery of neutrino oscillation, and Professor Kajita Takaki from Super K shared the Physics Nobel Prize of 2015 with Professor Arthur McDonald from uh, Snow Experiment. And finally, our experiment, Hyper Kamiokande, which will be eight times uh, bigger than Super Kamiokande, uh, and forcing to start taking data in, uh, in five years. And then hopefully uh, it will observe Liptonic CPS symmetry violation or discover a dark matter candidate and maybe a proton decay event. All these are without any doubt Nobel Prize discoveries. If it's happening, it, it is forcing to be in in 2035 uh, or uh, three or my years. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I thought that I have like 10 minutes. No, two. Sorry. Okay. Okay, now, now, let, now let's focus on Hyperkey. Uh, it is a cylindrical underground water cheering cup detector being constructed in Tochibura mine in Japan. Um, 650 meters underground uh, to shield it from background cosmic radiations. The detector is 71 meters high, 68 meters diameter, and will be filled with 260 million liters of ultra pure water, making it not only the biggest detector of its kind, but also the biggest underground water tank ever built. The walls of the water tank will be equipped with around 40,000 ultra sensitive photomultiplier tube, as you can see in the picture. These are like the eyes of the detector. And uh, unlike its predecessors, Hyper-K will, will use a combination of 20 inch box and line PMTs and three inch multi, multi PMTs that, that you can see in the pictures, which will provide a better efficiency and um, time and vertex resolution. With, with such configuration, um, Hyper-K will be able to, uh, to observe neutrinos from different sources, namely uh, astrophysical, like the supernovae, solar uh, and atmospheric neutrinos, but also man-made neutrinos uh, created in our particle accelerators, like the one I have mentioned of the G-Park accelerator. And yeah, proton decay. Hyper-K will be the most sensitive detector to such events. So if it wasn't discovered, surely a new lower limit to a proton's lifetime will be, will be set. The Hyper-K organization is a worldwide collaboration of more than 500 researchers from 20 countries from uh, almost every continent, uh, except, I guess, Australia. And here you can, see, you can see the evolution of the numbers of collaborators. Morocco joined officially a year ago, being the the first and up to now the only African country to do to do so. And here I mentioned the four universities participating in the experiment. Uh, where Ibn Tofai University, my home institute, is um, the project's holder, and Professor Gouverneur Mohamed is representing Morocco in the in the experiment. This is the the schedule timeline for deconstruction. We are now at the phase of PMT production and carbon excavation. Deconstruction is foreseen to be completed. Uh, by the end of the final quarter of 2026 and data seeking should start by 2027. Now let's talk about the Moroccan participation. Um, the four universities are mainly interested in these tasks, in three tasks, the textual calibration, physics analysis, and uh, computing uh, uh, the, the great enforcement, computing software uh, uh, experiments. Um, we can break the first task down to three parts. First, the low energy cross calibration using a nuclear device we call the DTG or the deuterium tritium uh, neutron generator. We will uh, talk about this next if we had time. Um, the development of deployment system to get this device um, inside uh, the detector 
And third, the pre-calibration of our PMT is also called exciter calibration. And we will explain what that, what that is in a moment. Rafiq, could we, I, I, I know there's a lot more to be said, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Okay, um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sorry if I, if I exceeded time. I, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I think you have the slides. If anyone had any questions, you can send them through my email. It's uh, at the first page. Okay, that would be excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. With, with that, we actually are at the end of our session and uh, going now into the lunch break. I'd like to thank all my speakers for uh, their interesting topics. I, I'm sure we could have spent much more time on each of them and uh, have, there was still lots to learn. For those speakers that are here, uh, you can find them at lunch to, if you have any questions. And for our remote speakers, if uh, hopefully we've got some contact details on the slides and uh, people can contact you remote through that, that's, through that. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe we commence at two o'clock after the lunch break. Thank you.